Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Let's Talk About It from the Bainbridge Island Senior Center. And, and it is my distinct pleasure because uh, I've known Anne for years. This is Anne Lovejoy. And uh, I always like to call her the Renaissance woman of uh, Bainbridge Island because, you know, she, she knows a lot a lot about gardening and cooking and preserving and art. And uh, I'm just delighted to introduce you. So thank you, Ian. Take it away. Thanks, Karen. Karen and I actually used to work together at Lindsley's Fine Clothing. And we both still wear the stuff we got there <laughs> probably for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I miss that shop. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for showing up. I did. Um, I walked around the garden this morning, and one of the things I found can you see this little yeah. bouquet? So those brown and yellow and gold flowers are called Bidens. And I thought it was awesome that even through the frost and snow, the Bidens still bloom. Um, just a little moment of niceness in the, in the winter garden, right? They it still persisted. They still persisted and they're still there. I love that. Also got some uh, calendulas which are the calendar flower, and they bloom pretty much all through the whole year, um, off and on. And some feverfew, which is actually a sovereign remedy for uh, migraine headaches. In fact, an article in the English Lancet, which is like our American Academy of uh, Physicians magazine, the Lancet article said they did studies and found that the eating one leaf of feverfew every day in your salad or something was better than any of the medications available for controlling migraines, which I thought was pretty great. Um, pretty handy little dandy flower. And one of the things I found that I was so pleased about is the last of my sweet peas, right? Oh. They still smelled so wonderful. Mm -hmm. They're fading fast, but there's still a few out there. I always love to go and just look around the garden after a heavy frost. It's amazing to me how many bees and pollinators are still there. And this morning when I was doing that, I had hummingbirds buzzing me because they're still getting nectar from the fuchsias. And a lot of the hardy fuchsias are still blooming away perfectly happily. Um, so that's something to remember too, that don't want to tidy up too soon or perhaps at all, because it's so much better for the pollinators and creatures like the hummingbirds to have things to eat and things to drink all through the winter. Besides, if you leave stuff standing, not only will many, many pollinators find places to make homes in it over the winter or go dormant in it or lay their eggs in it, things like clumps of grasses or even fading perennials, you can leave a lot of that stuff standing and call it a nature preserve. If anyone tries to give you flack about it, you can just point out that it's a bird sanctuary and a nature preserve. And the really good news about all that is by the time you do decide to do something about it, like come February or March, it's all rotted down in place. It's strengthening the soil. It's feeding the biota. All the natural creatures are able to get up and come out of their uh, eggs or hatch out of their, ca their uh, caterpillars or whatever it might be. And you will have very little litter to clean up. So it's not just the lazy way to do it. It's actually the benign, environmentally correct way to do it. Um, I kind of love that. So, uh, but don't get too hasty with the clippers. That's what I would say. Several people have asked if it's time to prune the roses. And I would say no for a number of reasons. For one thing, rose, roses uh, can get their tops killed off in cold weather. And we did have a frost, a real freeze, and we will probably have some more. So I don't let the roses, I don't cut back roses until about the middle of February. And you definitely want them to set a few um, rose hips because the formation of those hips, so don't cut off the faded flowers either. Let them sit there till they turn into hips because rose hips tell the hormonally drive the canes to harden up and toughen up for winter. So it's important to let that happen. And then of course the birds like to eat them too. And they're really pretty in wreaths and things like that. I'm hoping that some of you have brought questions to the table so that I don't have to just sit here and talk and talk and talk. <laughs> if you do, please jump in or with put it in the chat and I can we can all see that on the side. Um, I did have some questions from various people and and one of them was is this a good time to spread compost and yes even if the ground is frozen this is a very good time uh to to spread compost and you don't have to rake up the leaves 
spread it right over the top of those leaves because rotting leaves are one of the best things you can offer your soil in terms of nutrients. Um, even big ones like big leaf maples, if you have a ton of them, they do tend to mat up. And, and if you have um, a little shredder or if you have a lawnmower, you can run them through the lawnmower and then uh, that shreds them up and they break down faster because bacteria work on broken edges better than on solid edges, if that makes sense. So a great big leaf can take a long time to break down, but if you break it up um, or shred it, it will break down much, much faster. And I see Rita saying he's put green grass clippings and leaves in his compost pile. And that is definitely because a, a great way to go because that combination of something green and fresh and something dried and old will break down very quickly and provide a good nutrient, um, a balance, which is what we're always looking for compost. Now, Sheila's asking why her tomatoes turned black um, even before the frost. Well, tomatoes are very temperature sensitive because they come from places like the Galapagos Island from Central and, uh, and Deep South America. And they really, anything under 55 degrees is, is too cold for them and they'll start getting cold damage. And the black spots are cellular damage. It's like a cold burn, essentially. And they can get wind burn too. So usually once it starts dipping into the 40s, I'll pick all my tomatoes. And if you have an empty egg carton, you can put the tomatoes one by one into your egg carton and that will provide enough airflow around them that they, instead of rotting, they'll go ahead and ripen. You can also put them in a brown bag with a banana, bananas or an apple, both of which put off a lot of ethylene gas, which are, um, ethylene gas is one of the thing, the gases that helps all kinds of fruits ripen properly and quickly. So that's a possibility too. Um, but if you have a ton of them, you, I think we talked about this, you can slow roast them at 225 with a little avocado oil, or you can um, chop them up and actually freeze them. I didn't catch what Reed just posted there. Uh, he wanted to know if uh, he should put straw on his um, uh, plant. Ah. Let me see. Okay, so when you, yeah, you can put straw on your compost heap, you can put, and you want bedding straw, you don't want hay, because hay is full of seeds, which is protein, and what, that's what people feed their horses, their animals, but bedding straw is supposed to be without the seed, and <clears throat> it's also a, kind of a different texture, and that is great coverage for your compost heap, it's great coverage for beds that have been cleared, like your, if you've harvested, and maybe you haven't put in a cover crop, um, uh, yeah, so when you buy a bale of straw, it comes with, it's got big strings around it. If you cut those, they'll pop off and it starts to come apart in sort of chunks that are called uh, flakes, which you can see why when you look at them. And if you take a flake of straw, of bedding straw, and you actually open it up, and then you can spread it all around, it will not just, um, it will feed your soil, it will suppress weeds, it will prevent erosion, and it actually also, uh, makes kind of a natural cover that doesn't blow away very easily. So if you have the leaves and things are starting to blow, you can put straw on top of it and that actually will wet down and make a good um, good holder, a placeholder. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I'm seeing a few heads nod. <laughs> but yeah, leaving the leaves is really one of the best things you can do. The other thing I think I've talked about before is um, if you're covering a big bed that you're trying to renovate or refresh, you can cover it as deeply as you can with leaves and then put some bird netting on top of that with rocks to keep it from blowing away. And that will hold all those leaves in place too until they get good and wet and start rotting down nicely. One of the good tricks. Sheila, you were saying, can you treat green tomatoes just like you do red ones? Um, yeah, if you, green tomatoes are often very tart which can be nice in a, um, like in a curry or something like that. Even sliced really thinly into a salad, the green, the tartness of a green tomato is really quite pleasant. But if you roast them, it brings up the sweetness a little bit. Um, and you can freeze them after they're roasted or you can can them or just keep a few in the fridge. Depends on how many you have. Ah, Reed is saying, can you talk about how to make a cold frame? Yes, in fact, 
It's funny, I just wrote an article about that because this is the perfect time to get a cold frame set up. So a cold frame is basically a, a bottomless box that usually has a top, a clear top that can be made with old storm windows. I like old double pane uh, windows that have been uh, where the seal has been blown and they get condensation in them because in a house, of course, that's not very slightly or pretty, but in the garden, that little mist that forms when it's warm, it'll get misted. Um, that protects your plants from getting scorched on a hot, a hot, a relatively sunny, warm winter day. Um, tender plants can actually get a little bit of a, of a burn that way. Um, so you can make a cold frame out of wood. Uh, you can make a cold frame out of cement blocks. You can make a really simple cold frame out of bales of straw where you put um, even just four of them, right, to make a, a hollow square um, and then put your, fill it with soil or part about halfway up. And then you can put seedlings in there or tender plants or things like your garlic, um, greens. It's really good for lettuce and stuff. The, um, one thing about cold frames is that uh, the traditional ones are usually higher at the back and lower at the front. And that's because they put thing, taller things like kale and Brussels sprouts toward the back and then lettuces and things at the front. Um, and it's angled to the south, not to the east, because you don't want anything it, it, that's tender to get hit by the eastern sun before it has a chance to thaw out. Because that first blast of sunshine, even the weak winter sunshine, can actually literally explode this plant cells. So you want to tilt it a little more to the south so that by the time the sun gets on it, the plants have thawed out a little bit and are ready to take advantage of that light. The other thing you can make is a hot frame. And that's kind of a fun thing. Uh, if you have access to not uh, to recent <laughs> or fresh manure, cow uh, or horse manure, and all over the island, there's lots of places where you can, um, if you go to the Barnaby stables or something, they'll let you take a bucket of fresh manure. The thing, this is a Victorian technique. They would do a frame like the straw bale frame, for instance, and you might make it two bales long and two bales wide. And so you'd need eight bales altogether, right? Um, and put some bare soil at the bottom and then cover it with three to four inches of hot manure steamy, nasty, lovely, fresh, hot manure, and then put on top of that another six to eight inches of soil, topsoil or garden soil. And what will happen is the warmth of that uh, manure will provide enough root warmth that it really speeds the growth of things like uh, greens, especially lettuce, spinach, even you could do baby carrots, you could do um, onions, and things like that and have an earlier harvest than you would otherwise. And that was something the Victorians were very fond of doing. They made big, huge hothouses even full of fresh manure covered with enough of the uh, garden soil that it didn't, the plant's roots wouldn't burn. And then of course, through the winter, the manure would mature and cool off. And then they'd turn that over and it would be really nice soil to put in the garden again. I hope that answers some of your questions. If you do decide to make one out of wood, you want to be sure you're not using treated wood because the chemicals that are involved in treated wood, including copper, can leach as much as six to eight inches into the soil. And in a small cold frame, that doesn't leave you a very big area to plant into. Plus, you don't really want to be eating the stuff that makes wood preservatives. So either you would use cedar or you could use, again, the concrete blocks. Um, and cement also leaches out a little bit and becomes a little more uh, alkaline, but that is actually okay. It's not that much. And if you um, it, if you just put a piece of um, that row cover, that woven row cover against between the soil and the, the concrete blocks, that will keep the leachate on the right side of the business. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's sort of hilarious. I feel like I'm such a geek about stuff like this. And it's sort of amazing to me that anyone wants to hear it. We like your geeking. We like your geeking. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. <laughs> I did um, 
I wanted to show you a couple of things that I'm doing with my grink. Oh no, I know what I wanted to show you. Do you remember a month ago, I planted a garlic for and showed you how to do it? Well, here it is. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it's already about a foot high and it's um, starting to form a bulb. And this will be, I planted the rest of them outside. This was outside too, but I put it in a pot so I could bring it back in and show you what happens. But in just a month, and it's already got roots coming out the bottom, so it's ready to go into the ground. Um, but garlic planted anytime between now and, and the winter holidays will have a very good chance of growing up and making nice big plump bulbs that would be harvestable in like June and July. So if your garlic starts to sprout, you can take it outside and plant it. And again, the bigger the, the corm that you plant, um, if, if you take the littlest cloves, they'll make very small heads. But if you take the bigger cloves, they'll make nice big heads. And that's a way to grow your own and over and over keep collecting the biggest, uh, plumpest cloves and you'll end up having your own strain of large cloved garlic. Kind of cool. I get um, garlic, I trade with my neighbor too. She saved the little, when garlic flowers, the flowers will actually turn to tiny bulbs. They'll form little bulbs on the stem if you leave the flower stem to dry. And so not just seeds, but you'll see there, the seeds will actually sprout and they'll form tiny, tiny bulbs. You can plant those too, but they'll take longer, like maybe three years to come to full size. A clove will head up in just a matter of six months or so. Mix it a little faster, but it's still pretty fun to know you can grow your own uh, from pretty much anything. <laughs> One thing my, um, my granddaughter and I have been doing is collecting seeds of all the things she likes. And someone gave us a wonderful book called Miss Rumpheus about an, a woman from New England whose grandfather told her that she had to make the world more beautiful. And she loved lupin flowers. And so she started planting them wherever she went and her kids did and her grandkids did. And it, the story kind of goes on and on into the generations. Well, Cecily, who's four, thought that was wonderful. And she said, I would like to make the world more beautiful too. So we started saving seeds of things like the calendulas and the Bidens and forget-me-nots and uh, all kinds of things that grow in our garden happily, poppies especially. And we made little mixtures of them. And then when we go for walks, she takes her little mixture box with her and she puts pinches of seeds all along the sidewalk and on empty places in gardens and stuff. So for Christmas this year, for the holidays, she decided she wanted to make seed boxes for her friends. So <laughs> we're using the, um, I don't know if you can see, this was a, a bulk department. It had roasted garlic powder in it, but it now has a seed mixture. And we're gonna fill a bunch of these boxes and put a, a little cute label over the front. And that will be Cecily's gift to her friends, um, which I think is such a cool idea, right? Yeah. That's fantastic. It is. You know, yeah. and you could, if you didn't save your own seed, you could buy a few pa packages of seed and mix them up like that. Um, but I just think it's a really fun way to get children to think about plants and kind of the whole continuity of, of the garden cycle and to have an early start with really connecting to the natural world. You know, kids are so much closer to the ground. I think they tend to be interested in plants, but... Uh, we can really help them build that that gardenership <laughs> early on. I think it's wonderful. Another thing we made was we um, we gathered lavender this summer, and then we made lavender sugar. I don't know if you can see that there's um, lavender in this sugar, and we're gonna blend it up in the Cuisinart, and then it will become powdered up. And then we're going to give that to people too with with sachets of tea. And the tea we're making is actually pretty great. We collected rose petals and rose hips. I don't know if you can really see. Um, <laughs> and lavender and peppermint leaves and chamomile flowers. And we dried them and then we're mixing them all together and it actually makes a potpourri or it makes tea you can drink. It's actually pretty tasty. So we got little sachets um, at one of the tea stores and you can, the kids can stuff the sachets and seal them and give a gift of tea that they made themselves from the garden. It's, that, 
I really love things like that. It's so fun. We also had um, here, this one's basil salt, which was made with a cup per cup salt and basil foliage. Grind it up really fine. This one is uh, rosemary and garlic and lemon. And again, I don't know if you can see how well that looks. And those like two, you do a cup of herbs or whatever, lemon peel and garlic and things per cup of kosher salt, grind them together, bake them at 225 in a rimmed baking sheet until it forms a yellowy crust, kind of gets crunchy in about 15 or 20 minutes. And you let it cool a little bit, break it up and put it back in the quiz and buzz it again. And then you can put it in like TNC, the grocery store sells little jars like this, but you can also save interesting little jars from all kinds of things. We um we have a little jar collection that we use. And I think this one might have had honey in it or something. Um, but the kids have such a great time filling that kind of thing with tea or with their salts or with the things we made. And I actually enjoy it too. <laughs> Another thing we made is vinegars. And this one is my favorite. It's called nectarine, uh, nectarine vanilla. And it's got a vanilla bean in it. Or so nectarine vanilla bean vinegar, right? Um, when you make fruit vinegars, you can use frozen fruit. You can make raspberry, blueberry, cranberry, all kinds of things. And that is such a fun gift to give. And they're beautiful and they're really healthful. So um, easy to make. There's dozens of recipes online. But basically, it's like two cups of fruit, uh, two cups of vinegar, one cup of water. Boil it down for 10 minutes. Let it steep overnight and then just um, use a sieve, pour it through a sieve. And what I do is I put a little sieve inside a funnel so that you can capture it and put it right into a bottle. But those are beautiful. And the cranberry one is really pretty, bright red, nice for the holidays. Another thing we were doing is um, making wreaths. We're starting to make outdoor wreaths as well as indoor wreaths. And we take twiggy things like vines and uh, alder twigs and willow twigs and whatever we can find, pieces of softer bamboo, and weave a circle. And then stick all kinds of greenery in there, like huckleberries and um, uh, hydrangeas, all the stuff that, you know, the things that still look nice in the garden, oregano seed heads and things like that. Um, even scotch broom makes a really nice poof kind of. And instead of using wire to catch them together, we stuff the chinks with moss. And that way they can go right into the compost heap when you're done. And the kids like to put them in their garden as well as on the doors and things. And I think that's so sweet to have like a little sort of habitat wreath <laughs> that you can just let it gently molder down, but it's still decorative through the cooler months. Another thing we made uh, that was pretty fun was candles, big beeswax candles and they collected things like alder cones and little sprays of cedar and some dried herb things that were pretty rosemary and stuff like that and we used a hair dryer to on the outside of the candle to get it kind of softened up and then they'd stick on the cedar or they'd stick on the fir cones with the back of a spoon so they didn't burn their fingers and then we put a bow on it, it looks beautiful <laughs> and then it it's like one of those really simple things but I do stuff like that too it's I use my grandchildren as an excuse but really I'm the one who's playing around and having a really good time with all these things <laughs> I, there's something so refreshing to me about handling natural materials whether it's dried herbs or fresh food it's all just so satisfying uh, one of the things we're doing too is we got um, little tiny pots of winterberry, which is a relative of Salau that comes from back east and has these great big red berries and beautiful pink and white uh, bell flowers. And it's called winterberry or tea berry. And the, the berries actually taste a little bit like wintergreen, that kind of pepperminty flavor a little bit. Uh, and it's just a real pretty thing for a, you can use it on the table for a holiday Thanksgiving or something and then put it out into the garden or it will grow really nicely in a container on a deck. Um, but it's a real cheerful little thing for the winter months because it blooms and it fruits at the same time. So you get the flowers and the berries. It's just really pretty. It's 
kind of a small, low creeper. Doesn't get big like Salal. <laughs> Where do we have that? Yeah. Um, I think all the nurseries have them right now, but even some of the grocery stores have it sometimes. Oh, okay. This particular one came from Bainbridge Gardens, um, and they come in little tiny pots. As you can see, they're like a two-inch pot, but I think that's about the cutest thing. And you can just stick that into a, like a little basket or something, and it's adorable. Right? Oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. We also made... Um, uh, candles that we put on rounds of wood. We took some logs and, and had daddy slice them with the uh, chainsaw. And then, so then you have a round of wood about so big. And then we melted the bottom of the candle and stuck the candle on that. And that made really nice little centerpieces too. We have such a good time. The other thing we did is collect big baskets of the pine cones that are especially big. They make really good fire starters for people who have fireplaces or wood stoves that are have the open part um and so we saved made bags of those that we saved the onion bags the mesh bags and put the big cones in there and we also take some and put uh suet get suet at the grocery store and buy dried mealworms which all the chickens love those so a lot of the like bay hay and feed has dried mealworms in bags and sunflower seeds, and we mushed them all together, which was great fun, and then packed them into the, um, the big pine pine cones and then hang those outside as kind of a winter present for the animals, for the birds. And especially, then you start getting woodpeckers and flickers. Those big birds love suet, and they really like the dead mealy worms too. It's a little <laughs> gross, but uh, but it's really good for birds. To, they, don't, they don't need sugar, but they need protein and harder for them to find bugs and things in the winter time. Yes. <laughs> we have a, a tree that needed to be um, taken out. It was, it was a, oh, I forget what it was. It was an evergreen tree that died back here in the corner where or the condo I lived. And the city said you could take it down, but you have to leave about, I think it was eight feet of the stump uh -huh. because it's a habitat tree. Right. Yeah. And, and if you do that, you'll see that it is habitat, that even, you know, a big tree with in full growth can host so many birds and animals and critters all the way up and down the, the trunk. And even just that eight foot, what that's left over, you'll discover that it can have um, flickers and, and woodpeckers will make holes and then you might get bats moving in. Uh, oh. We saw there's one here that, that's like that, that's about 10 feet high. And it has a little bat colony on the side where the woodpeckers had made the holes. Um, you'll see all kinds of bugs and beetles crawling up and down. I just, I feel like we're turning the corner from being obsessed with controlling the natural world to starting to be enchanted by it again and learning to look. And again, that's one of the things for me, my grandkids who are four and seven, they're still at the enchanted ages. So they see stuff and they're really taken with it. But they are still... They'll spend a half an hour looking at pebbles and choosing just the right ones. Um, I might do that too, but I might be a little embarrassed about it. They're not embarrassed at all. <laughs> and I just, I think it's that, uh, even though it's cold and windy and nasty, it's still beautiful outside. We um, we spent some time collecting the most beautiful leaves we could find. And then we iron them between sheets of wax paper. <laughs> do you remember doing that? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and then put them on the windows. Uh, it's pretty fun. Love it. I should have been a kindergarten teacher, don't you think? Oh, you would have, well. I missed my call. Children to have you as yeah, a teacher. Yeah. Lucky. Do you have a question, Bonnie? No. And, well, yeah. it isn't a question. It's just a kind of a comment, but I'm thinking all of these lovely ideas you're doing with the, your grandchildren, it would make such a wonderful book. Oh. It would make such a wonderful book. It would, That's um, an interesting idea. You, you know, I like um, a book for that kind of teaches other people, you know, like, like other grandmas or whatever, just a, a ways to share with your grandchildren. It's just such, it's, so um, beautiful. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it, there are some books like that, but you know, there can never be too many. 
I, I think you ought to do that, Anne. And I think, but I think you do it, uh, not only you, but the four and the seven year old, your grandchildren do it with you. Do the, um, do the mm -hmm. book with you. you. You have another book in you, don't you? You have, a, you, I know you do. <laughs> of course you do. I think Bonnie's absolutely right on. I kind of feel like I've done my share. What if I put some of these stories in the, in the flash yeah. now and again? That would be good. Would that be interesting to people? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I love stuff like that. And I just thought, yeah. you know, you can just tuck a little this or yeah. that, like some random yeah. things. But like I like little recipes and things to make a, something simple, like the, the herb tea that can also make a potpourri. That's to me kind of magic, right? Mm -hmm. um, we made. Uh, yes. Or French herb blend too, like um, it's dried rosemary, oregano, thyme, parsley, and lavender. And we made little sachets of that for people too. And you grind it up just like with the salts. Um, I, the smells, the holding things. I think when we're stuck indoors so much, it's good to remember we can bring some of the outdoors back in. Um, oh, and I was going to show you, I forgot to bring it out here. Uh, my oldest amaryllis which is now six or seven years old i think has got us started to sprout it's got a two inch sprout on it so <laughs> i'm kind of excited about that it's still one of the things that happens with amaryllis is people don't know if they can keep them growing and they forget and they end up throwing them away if you treat them like a house plant and you actually wipe down the leaves every month or so and feed them once a month with a half strength house plant fertilizer um, they'll keep growing and growing and growing and they get big, these big strappy. And about on every fifth strap, there's going to be a bloom stock. So if you can get six or seven or eight or even 10 or 12 um, leaves on those things in June, July, August, and then you let them dry out a little bit for a couple months and then you start watering them again, and they'll, they'll send up an, one or two or sometimes three bloom stocks. I've actually put a couple in my garden wow. and they came through and they bloomed this summer. That's so cool. if you have a protected env garden environment, you can actually put them wow. outside. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Hey, they're the kind of bulb you want to leave the top quarter of it exposed so that it's not planted up to its chin. It's just planted up to its shoulders. Right, right. So, And Christy Heath, by the way, hi, Christy, long time no see. Um, she had a question. What can I put around my six by 14 ground bed to limit the slug fest in the spring? We all want to know that. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just in the spring. I mean, they were busy oh. yesterday, right? Um, it's slugs and snails have had a banner year. And the problem is that the tiny baby slugs are not attracted to bait. So they, if you, even if you use a safe bait like sluggo, they won't eat it. Only the grownups will. Um, the, one thing to remember is that slugs and snails are mutually adhesive. So you can pick up a snail and use it to pick up slugs and then drop them in the, I put them in the green waste actually <laughs> myself. Um, or, a, you know, if you have a, a bowl of soapy water, you can drown them in there. Um, the thing that will get them is beer. And I think I've discussed this before that the, in a really interesting long-term test that was run in Pennsylvania, it was discovered that slugs prefer poly girl light, dark, excuse me, St. Poly girl dark, which is probably the cheapest beer in the entire market. Um, it's pretty crappy, but the slugs love it. So you can set bottles, like if you had a bottle or jar, you set it at an angle so that it's into the soil and it needs to be bigger than this. Um, and then you put a little beer in the bottom and they crawl in and then get drunk and not be able to get out and drown. So there's that. You can use copper um, on the outside to keep the slugs out, but it won't do anything about the slugs that are already in. And what happens with copper sheathing is that they'll actually get, a, a, they'll get electrocuted. The salt and moisture in the slug body interacts with the copper. They get a, a, sometimes quite severe shock. If it's a mild enough shock, they'll just turn around and go somewhere else. But if they keep trying to climb up, they'll get a harder shock and it usually kills them. So the thing to do about that is you can protect the outside with the copper, but the inside you're gonna have to hand pick until or use various 
baits if you have large slugs and snails and beer if they're all small. Uh, and when you use slug bait, something like a sluggo, sluggo is based on iron oxide, which is a naturally occurring mineral that is in water and soils almost around the world. Um, but this, but the iron oxide is fatal to mollusks. And even though slugs don't have the shell of the snails, they're still susceptible. So they'll get dried out by the um, iron oxide. So that is one other good way to, um, that's the kind of bait you can use, but you don't need to broadcast it. You just put a tiny bit, like a quarter teaspoon around the base of a plant because they can't fly. They just have to climb. And so rather than scattering it everywhere and having the birds come and eat it, it won't hurt the birds, but it's wasteful. You can put it right close to the base. The other thing you can do is start mulching with coffee grounds, used coffee grounds. Um, coffee desiccates slugs and um, they actually dry up into little, I used to make, we used to make little Santa Claus ornaments out of them. You get the dried slugs and put little tiny hats on and hang them on our Christmas tree or earrings. Um, yeah, it's that Northwestern sense of humor. But you, you, really, you really didn't do that, did yeah. you? No. Oh my God. <laughs> Why do I believe that? We gave them that as Christmas presents one year and some people tried to give them back. Um, but I thought they were cute. <laughs> so yeah, coffee grounds are a good way to go because it's also good for your soil. It's high in protein. It's like nine one one. Um, so that's another way to to think about protecting your plants. Um, if you don't drink coffee, you can usually go to one of the coffee places and ask for a bucket of coffee grounds. Uh, and most places are happily give you that or get it from your neighbors. Just take the papers out. You don't need that. Oh, great suggestions. I hope that answered your question, Christy. If not, ask some more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I have to tell you, my um, camellia tea tree is going nuts. It has blossoms all over it. And I just don't understand why this is the year that it's doing it. Have you had it for a long time? Yes. Uh -huh. Probably. 10 years now. And it usually blooms in the summer? No, it usually blooms later. It's more in the winter, like a camellia. And, but it's, it's just full of bloom right now. Yeah, it's, I think, so most of the tea camellias are actually um, as the Sasanqua types, which are winter bloomers. Um, and they're usually not so big. But this year, it's been a weird year. Like some things were amazing and some things didn't do well at all. Like it was a lousy year for raspberries, but a great year for green beans. Who knows why, right? Things like that. Um, but the camellias, are, yeah, the, the Sasanqua camellias seem to be very happy and heavily budded up. You always want to watch in the snow that in the, if it if we get snow like we did a couple of years ago, their branches are pretty soft and it can weigh them down and then they get they lose their shape and it's hard to get it back. Um, one thing you can do to protect any kind of shrub if the store if it's predicted to have snow. Because our snow tends to be that wet, heavy kind that really harms the brand of shrubs, is you can get, again, bird netting, wrap the shrub around and fasten it with the zip ties, and that will give it, uh, keep it, have some integrity of shape and you won't lose it. And then just remember to take it off because it's like a girdle. It doesn't want to wear that all the time, but it helps keep things together in the winter time through the snow. Oh, great. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Yeah. Do you think we're going to have a snow this winter? Well, Noah, Noah thinks so. Um, it looks like, you know, because we're in the La Nina now pretty severely, and that means wetter and colder usually. Um, and as we're seeing, it's been chilly. We're getting some of those real deep frosts. Uh, snow is predicted in December and January a couple times. Not, it's hard to say though, because so many, there's so many factors and those long-term predictions are not always right on, but it, it does seem likely that we'll get at least some, um, but you know, that big snow in February that happened two years ago was completely unexpected and wasn't called in the early predictions at all. So you never really know what we're going to get. Um, but I'm yeah. having a really good feeling about January personally. Oh, good. Saying. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Might be mild and sunny. That would be great. Yeah. Um, usually, our ambient temperatures in the, here in this part of the Northwest 
is like a 44. If, if you ever pay attention to temperatures, which I do, um, it, 44 is a very typical daytime temperature. And we're sort of heading in that direction. And probably December, January, uh, February, that's kind of where we'll be. And then it depends. Some nights don't get a whole lot colder than that. Sometimes we get down into the 30s. Um, if we get the north wind and that northeast wind especially, that's when we get the dips and this, the real sudden colds snaps and that can really kind of mess up our plants. Mm -hmm. um, if that's called for, one of the things you can always do is just put some sheets over your best plants or anything that's tender. Um, sheets over big pots will help too, just a few degrees of, of protection um, and then take them off in the daytime, of course. But, uh, and if it does start to snow, and we start getting that heavy snow, one of the best things you can do is set your timer and every hour or so go out and gently with a soft broom or a soft rake, gently knock the snow off shrubs and small trees. Because um, that's when we big maple, like the Japanese maples can lose branches and also some of the more brittle things like willows and stuff will get shattered in that. But if we, because the snow will freeze and become very heavy, when it's icy, you know, wet snow. But if you keep knocking it off, it won't mount up as badly and you'll save your baby. You can only do it to so many plants. I use big, tall um, bamboo sticks sometimes for the mm. taller trees. And just, if you tap it lightly and don't stand right under where you're tapping because it's all gonna fall down on your head as I have discovered more than once. Right down the back of your shirt, right? <laughs> Can I quote you on that? You may. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I, I figured it. out what I really wanted was one of those sou'wester hats that the fishermen wear. Mm, yeah. <laughs> That's the back of your neck and stuff, and then it would just slide right off. But I didn't have that. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> Adventures with Anne. Adventures, that's right. <laughs> Mm, my goodness. One thing I would suggest is that you go around, your, uh, that's what we're doing here in my neighborhood. I have a, a tree company working with us today and we I did a um, call out to the neighbors and said, does anyone have hanging branches or dead branches or big um, branches that are overhanging their house that look like they might come down? Because we're expecting some big blows, some big windstorms. That would be mo more likely than snow really. And so if you do see that kind of situation and you should definitely get somebody over to help you get those down um, because big branches like that are really heavy and when they fall they get a lot of momentum and they can go right through a roof or through your car um, not optimal no no one thing i just found out today is that if power lines rub against a tree it's puget power puget um you know whatever it is <laughs> Yeah. You see, <laughs> it's their responsibility to clear the lines and they can bring brackets and move the lines out. I did not know that. And these tree people just told me that. They're like, oh, we don't do that work because it has to be an experienced lineman who works around power lines and trees. And you can call Puget Power and have them send out their crew and they will do the rough pruning and they will also um, put the brackets on to move the lines away from the tree trunks. Well, did that's not know. know. That's yeah. really important. It is important because it's a fire hazard, not just a interruption of service hazard, but it's definitely a fire hazard too. Um, but this is a really good time to go take your binoculars out there <laughs> and see what you can see up in your trees. Good, good plan. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, Thanksgiving is always known as the time yet the power goes out. Right. Oh, how many times have we done a turkey on a on the grill outside, right? Yeah, it's um, it's that <laughs> it's that time of the year, and it's in this area it's known for that. So the big windstorms. So anyhow, so does anybody else have any questions? You could unmike yourself, and you covered things pretty well, Anne. Well, thanks, Karen. This is you know it's really fun for me. I just. I love to be uh, to be able to talk about some of the stuff that I find so enchanting and find that other people are interested too. Uh, I think we just miss so much um, by forgetting that you don't have to be an expert at any of this stuff. 
You don't even have to be particularly good at it. Uh, it's not uh, a perfectionist culture. <laughs> it's like the sourdough thing, right? Like if the, those grizzly old 49ers could keep sourdough going in their tents, then it's not a, a kitchen challenge. And in the same way, so many growing herbs and doing these sort of simple homemade mixtures, it's not something you need a real solid recipe for. It's just something people have been doing for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Um, and I think we all just need to kind of trust ourselves a little more in those kinds of things. Yes. I happened to see on, um, I don't know, Facebook somewhere anyway, uh, back last week, I believe it was, about um, things that you could do with your grandkids. Um, and uh, I sent it along to my uh, son and daughter-in-law out in Wisconsin. Anyway, because um, they have the two little great grand, they have the two little grandkids. Anyway, it, it was a pumpkin. Take a pumpkin or two, um, but one, take the top off. And of course, the most fun is, is taking the seeds out, of course. That, that, that's, they love doing that anyway. And come to find out, they hadn't eaten pumpkin seeds before. And so they now have them. They, they have now been initiated to the world. But anyway, what they did was then hang it, hang it uh, with some vines, I think they used, um, as birdseed feeders. Great. And, oh. Yeah. And, it, and they they have a one that's um, about yay deep. The top was about yay deep. And then they have another one, which is a lot deeper And uh, for the for the birds. And the birds are coming like crazy, I heard, which is so much fun. I was so glad to see that they, I, I got the pictures of them making it, which was even better. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. My, yeah, it, was, it was 72 degrees out there. Oh. Yeah, it was over the weekend. Yeah, and it's 72 as of yesterday. It was still 72 out there. And I'm thinking, oh, what is wrong with this picture? <laughs> well, the, our little carved pumpkin started to get a black eye and uh, rotting from within. So I think you have a fairly short window of using, uh, but I've seen people do that with gourds where you dry the gourd out and then kind of hollow them and make bird feeders or bird nests, bird houses and things out of them for sure. But yeah, I mean, pumpkins, we made pumpkin pie out of um, one of the little sugar baby pumpkins that we hadn't done anything with. And we cut it up and roasted it. It was amazing. Um, it caramelized a little bit in the roasting. And then we uh, used the immersion blender to gush it all up. And it made the best pie. It was so good. Now we have another one. We just made a um, chicken curry with pumpkin. And we've made pumpkin muffins with pumpkin seeds and chocolate chips. And we just have so much fun. But yeah, those little sugar pumpkins, big field pumpkins are not actually very tasty. They're really not, um, they're really grown for jack-o'-lanterns mostly. Um, but if for pies, they use the sugar pies that have a much higher sugar content and they're much better flavor and not quite so stringy either. Yeah. I, that was the best pumpkin pie I've ever made it was with a Long Island cheese pumpkin believe it or not, uh -huh. but they, were, they sold it um, town and country and I roasted it so it had that caramelization. Best pumpkin yeah. pie ever. I think the caramelization does a lot. But the heritage varieties were bred for flavor mm -hmm. too, and, and we forget that. I mean, some of the field varieties were, born, were bred for um, feeding like sheep and pigs in the wintertime, so they're not necessarily that tasty. But one of the things that people used to do is in the summer, they would, um, when the vines were getting big, they would take a saucer of milk and make a little slice in the vine and put the, the slightly cut uh, stem into the saucer of milk and put a stone on top to keep it there. And it would take in the milk and it would give it the calcium that would keep the leaves from getting powdery mildew, but it also built a really firm shell for the pumpkins. Um, so they were much better keepers and bigger too. Kind of cool. So. If you have trouble with mildews or molds on your pumpkins, that's something to try for next year. You can just spray them with a 10% a solution of skim milk, powdered milk in water. Um, does the same thing. Wow. Yeah. The other thing that's really fun to do with pumpkins if you're growing them is you can etch on them fancy designs and stuff while they're still growing and they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and those designs will harden and be really, you can make really beautiful. The kids like to write their names on them, of course. Um, but you just cut lightly into not deep enough to really gouge it hard. But um, and you can draw and scroll and make these really pretty designs. And as the pumpkin gets bigger, it will still have all that design stuff on it. 
Wow. Yeah, really fun. <laughs> would you use like maybe a pencil lit? Um, how would, what would yeah, you or the, um, we used the, like, there's a, um, a tool that we used to use for cleaning under your nails that was wood. Do you remember those? Mm -hmm. a, a, a slanted top kind of, and you could like a depressor and, and use that. Or you can use like an exacto knife if you just cut shallow. Mm -hmm. But wow. yeah, it's fun. <laughs> I'll to try that next year. That's wonderful. I'll try to remind everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll get together somehow, either this yeah. way or. Oh, who knows? Where will we be next year? Who knows? I know. I know.